Welcome, Diane Seely Neal, and uh, pass her off to Linwood, who's going to do an introduction to this segment of our board meeting. And it will be a very brief introduction because I want to see what the students have come up with. Uh, <laughs> Diane's been Diane's been telling me all along that you know she's she was really happy with this group and you know the work they've done, and uh, you know I've I've been supportive of. Diane and her program for many years now and have, have been wanting to work with her uh, and get her out on some properties that I've, I've been managing and it, you know never really could work and so thanks to COVID uh, it worked this year and not many people are saying that not I haven't heard anybody say thanks to COVID we have done something we could never do before so um, you know before I turn over to Diane I also got to give a big hats off to Jeff and Joaquin and Travis for all the all the work they did uh, to put this uh, put this together. Um, I'm I'm just the guy behind the curtain, and everybody else gets to do the real work. So anyway, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Diane Healy Neal and Diane, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. All right, we had some microphone issues earlier today. So thanks so much for the opportunity to present to you today. I'm gonna to be doing a very small portion of this. Uh, I really wanna pass this off to the students. Um, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Make sure that all of you can see it. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna adjust this over. Um, I'm going to do one more adjustment here. Yep, that's, that's the way it is. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and get into uh, a little outline of what uh, we're going to talk about. Um, oh, wow, okay. So um, I'm going to do a very short uh, introduction. Um, for those of you that aren't very familiar with Forestry Challenge, I will talk about briefly about what it is. Um, a participation totals for this year in this very different format um, that was virtual. Um, I'll review the goals that were presented to the students, uh, your goals, and that was certainly key to their analysis of, of our situation. Um, we did decide to focus on the mixed hardwood conifer stands. It's sort of a difficult forest type out there. There's a lot of it out there and uh, certainly perhaps in need of some work. Uh, and then I'll explain how we uh, try to uh, help the students wrap their heads around what what we wanted them to do. We, we created this pathway approach, so I'll, I'll describe that as well. So uh, with that, I want to talk about Forestry Challenge. What is Forestry Challenge? So it is a program I created in 2003. It is a um, academic forestry competition for high school students. Um, there's three goals to the program. The first goal is to connect classroom math and science with the real world. So by doing forestry science out in the field, they understand that the things they're learning in the classroom matter. Um, most students, a lot of students don't like math, but they definitely use it. And then basic ecology, uh, there's a lot of scientific concepts that do apply. So uh, we try to introduce them to that. So that's goal one. Um, goal two is the opportunity to explore careers. And I love working with high school students because they're starting to realize that there's life after high school and um, they've got opportunities to make choices about the path that they're taking. So um, they're exploring and we sort of introduce them to this world of natural resource professions. Uh, some of them decide that this is not for them. Some of them decide this is exactly what they wanna do. So um, and it's an exciting time in, in their lives and um, we just like to show them the opportunities that are out there. So that is goal two. And goal three is just to remind them that even if they don't pursue a career in natural resources, they're probably at some point in their life's gonna enjoy the outdoors and we can actually manage forests for recreation and for the enjoyment of, of humans. So, um, you know, there's there's a connection there. So we do allow them some time at in-person events to play. Uh, half a day is just devoted to doing some fun activity outside. So um, that kind of leads me to say that normally our, our, we have location, four locations, um, and let's see if I can get back to this. So we normally have uh, Shasta, El Dorado, Santa Cruz, and San Bernardino events in the fall. And then we have a championship event in the spring. But when COVID hit, we canceled our championship from last year. And of course we had to cancel all our in-person events for this past fall, but um, not wanting to give up on the opportunity to, to um, 
you know, connect with students and do some forestry education, I approached Linwood, um, who, uh, who then introduced me to Jeff, and then we created this wonderful partnership with East Fall Forest. So um, we, we think that perhaps we'll be going back to events next fall, we don't know. But in the meantime, this was a great opportunity. And um, yes, uh, COVID presented an opportunity for us. And so um, we had participation from 22 schools. Uh, most of these schools were schools that were planning to come to an in-person event this past fall. Uh, we did get a few new schools that, that jumped on board. Um, and perhaps this online format allowed some schools to join in that, that could, you know, that maybe wouldn't have been able to make it to an event. So our year-end totals, uh, 22 schools, 41 teams, 229 students, and 59 volunteers. Um, so the student total is a little more than half of what we typically have in an in-person event here. We generally have about 400 students. So we felt like we did pretty well. Um, when students go to an in-person event, they get to sort of forget the rest of their life for a few days. They don't have to worry about turning in homework and going to sports practice and, you know, all the commitments they have going to work. Um, we, the students that were doing this online this fall had to do everything in addition to everything else in their lives for those few days. So um, we feel like we, we had a major victory here to get this many students. Uh, one other note that I just sort of calculated, we had calculated today, um, it just seemed like there were an awful lot of uh, females participating and the numbers, the, the, they, they played themselves out. We had 66% of our participants female this fall. And generally we have about 60, 56 to 60%. So we had a really great showing uh, from females and you know, with all the emphasis on STEM for women, this is a really positive thing. So that was a great number to, uh, to find today. So anyway, uh, our volunteers were also online uh, judging presentations, offering consultation sessions uh, during the different weeks that the students participated. So good participation considering it was a brand new format. I just want to remind you of the goals um, that Jeff and I came up with that were your goals for this forest. Um, and goals one and two are sort of a top tier. Goals three, four, and five are a second tier. So of course, um, we want to increase the presence of conifers on those, uh, on those mixed conifer, hardwood, hardwood conifer stands. Um, of course, you're trying to do some restoration here and that, that was certainly uh, primary. Um, but we've got to do it with the economic benefit. Um, the reality is you've got to not only be able to pay for what you're doing, but provide opportunities to the community for, uh, for jobs. Uh, number three was um, minimizing or eliminating use of herbicides. Uh, number four was the carbon sequestration piece. And number five was to reduce fire risk. So that is what we gave them um, to keep in mind with every uh, plan that they created, every pathway that they considered, those were the goals. Okay. Um, just again to remind you, we did focus on the mixed hardwood conifer, um, and that is about 30% of your uh, land base, so it's a significant percent uh, shown here on the map in peach. Uh, we did give the students data from four units, and you can see them two up here and two over here. So we did have data that we presented to them and then asked them to um, use a simulation that we ran simulations and then they used that, those outputs to come up with their ideas for, for restoration. So um, it's hard to kind of lay out the groundwork to help them understand what we wanted them to consider. So we came up with this idea of, a, of pathways. Um, so you can see we have a timeline across the top and then we have different options for both harvest and treatments and different combinations of those over time. So um, the students will get more into what they, you know, how they analyze these options and what they decided was the best pathway. But I did have some numbers on the right side and Jeff has not seen these numbers. We just put these together. So um, that is the number of teams that chose the different options. We asked them to choose the option that they felt was the best. So uh, of note here is the number 10 at the bottom for pathway 13. Uh, we had 10 teams choose that and five teams choose uh, pathway eight. And those are the two pathways we're gonna focus on today. I do wanna make note though, that 10 teams chose pathway two. Um, but what was interesting is none of those teams scored in the top 10. And I think you'll, you'll see that um, the other, the teams you're gonna hear from today um, did not choose pathway two, and I think they'll you'll understand why. Um, so yeah, none of the top 10 teams chose that pathway, but several of the lower scoring teams did. So kind of an interesting note there. 
Okay, um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Mira Putz. She's from Woodside High School, and I'm gonna be advancing the slides for her, so um, she's gonna be taking it from here. So Mira, go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Mira, and I'm from Woodside High School. Uh, both Chloe and I are juniors, and it was our first time participating in the Forestry Challenge. Um, and just a little note about my school, Woodside is unique because we have an environmental program called the Green Academy, which I'm involved in. All right, next slide. Okay, so James Able Forestry gathered data on forest inventory on four mixed hardwood conifer plots, as Diane mentioned, which is our focus for the forestry challenge. Um, a forest inventory collects data on different parameters such as species composition, tree density, basal area, and volume, which is all to help document change and help foresters analyze what they need to do to maintain forest health. The forest inventory data we were given was taken on these four units, and you can see we averaged them out on the top row there, but the individual results are uh, there below as well. So historically in Usal Forest, these mixed hardwood conifer plots would have been primarily dominated by conifers in a ratio of around 50-50 between two conifer species, coastal redwoods and Douglas fir. However, tan oak has dominated many parts of Usal Forest because of over-harvesting of conifers from the 70s and 80s. Tan oak, a hardwood species, is adapted to thrive in sunny environments, so the available space created by over-harvesting provided a perfect environment for them to take over and shade out the conifers. Conifers, particularly redwoods, have decreased dra dramatically from their historic numbers. The focus for this plan is on mixed hardwood conifer stands, as Diane mentioned, because there is an opportunity to restore these stands back to their historic conifer-dominated conditions. There are three main takeaways of the forest inventory data outlined in the graph on this slide. Firstly, the average diameter is very small, which is illustrated by the many tall bars in the smaller diameter, so on the left portion of the graph there. This signals a younger forest instead of an older forest. Secondly, redwoods, the orange portion of the graph there, make up a very small portion of the stand. Third, there are a lot of hardwoods, mostly tan oak, represented by the gray portions of the bars. With a combination of harvest and vegetation treatments, we can reduce those tan oak populations and increase conifer percentages. Okay, so the first harvest option is variable retention, which is the cutting of a specific variety of trees to achieve various ecological, social, and geomorphic objectives. Variable retention is neither even nor uneven aged silviculture and falls into the category of an alternative prescription harvest. An important characteristic of this method is that harvest would occur on year zero, and there would be an immediate gain in value from harvesting redwoods and Douglas fir. On the right, we can see a model of clumpy gappy, which is how a restored old growth forest would look and variable retention can help us achieve that. All right. So um, there's another type of silvicultural option. So another type of harvest option called selection harvest. And there are two types of selection harvest. The first one is a single tree selection and the second is a group selection, both of which have been used in USAL forest in the past. Single tree selection is when individual trees are cut and group selection involves the up to a half, two and a half acres of trees being cut at one time. Selection harvest would be used for a year 15 harvest in 2035, which would allow for greater yields than variable retention since the trees would be allowed more time to grow. But that also means that treatments at year zero would result in a cash deficit for 15 years. Planting in year 16 under this approach would allow for increased control of regeneration. All right, so information on harvest values was given to us by Jeff Hauser so that we could do an economic analysis of each pathway. On the left side, we have calculations for variable retention harvest, which uses current uh, values for log value and cost. The final gain per acre under variable retention harvest, which includes a deduction for planning costs, provides a final gain of $81.5 per acre, which is applicable for pathways two through 10. This profit would be used to fund treatments later on. On the right side of the table, we see the predicted value for pathway 12, an example of the selection harvest. The log values and this cost are simply predictions, hence the question marks. Since vegetation treatments for pathway 11 through 12, 11 through 13 are different at each point, the board feet volume is not the same for each pathway. Okay, there's also two options for vegetation treatment. 
Filling costs $200 per acre. Frilling involves hacking into the tree at breast height and then applying chemicals to the cambium, causing the tree to slowly die. Benefits of frilling over mangle treatment are that the treatment is less expensive and the tan oaks are not likely to re-sprout. Cons of frilling are that it involves the use of chemicals, which is contrary to one of your goals, and the snags left after the treatment pose a fire risk. With manual treatment, trees are manually cut down and are either left on site or removed to be used for purposes. The pros of manual treatment are that if the trees are taken off site, fire risk is reduced. Cons of manual treatment include the fact that the treatment is much more expensive and there is a higher possibility for regrowth. So lastly, the forest vegetation simulator, da simulator data shown here predicts the outcomes for the end of the 60 year restoration period in 2080 under each, pa under each pathway. Above the larger chart, we can see a similar smaller chart which contains data from the 2020 forest inventory. Based on your goals for USAL's future restored forest, we kept in mind the goal for 2080 of a higher basal area of redwoods and dug firs per acre and a lower basal area of hardwoods. We were also encouraged to consider pathways with, with an increased percentage of conifers, taller trees and trees with higher, larger diameters because they represent an older growth forest, fewer trees per acre to, to decrease forest density and overcrowding, an increase in carbon sequestration and reduced fire risk. Although we will not be presenting, we chose pathway 13 with a minor adjustment to increase the percentage of redwoods. Hey, thank you so much, Mira. All right, so um, now that you've got some of the groundwork that the students were given, uh, we're gonna start talking about the pathways that, that two various teams chose. So um, next up is Vista Del Lago High School, uh, Eileen Kim representing their team. Uh, their team actually is the highest scoring team of all the teams uh, this fall. So I'm gonna let Eileen take it from here. Hi, my name is Eileen. My team is me, Jessica Wu, Afni Duda, and Adeline Lung. And we are from Vista del Lago High School. And this was our first time competing in the forestry challenge. This opportunity has been really amazing because we learned so much about the USAL forest and general forestry education as well. Next. So here's a cost comparison before I start going into more detail. So as you can see, pathway one, which is the control, has no monetary gain or loss. However, pathways two to nine have a negative revenue, while pathways 10 to 13 have a positive revenue. Next. So I'm gonna be discussing the control, pathway two, which is variable retention and frilling twice. And I'll be comparing those two with pathway 13, which is frilling at year zero and selection harvest and plant at years 15 and 16. Next. So the first goal I'm gonna be discussing is Goal one, which is restoration, and this is a top tier goal. So this means increasing the conifers, especially coastal redwoods, to achieve that pre-settlement forest mosaic. The control was not desirable regarding this goal because although the diameters and tree heights were high, the forest was extremely dense and there were still a lot of hardwoods left. Pathway two was a lot more desirable because it used variable retention to achieve that clumpy, gappy landscape. Additionally, there were the largest number of coastal redwoods and the least amount of hardwoods. And pathway 13 had the least trees per acre and there were somewhat higher percentage of conifers and there were less hardwoods than the control. And you can see the simulation chart on the bottom. And if you look at the percent conifers group A, you can see that pathway two has 80% conifers, pathway 13 is 68%, the control is 54% conifers. Next. Here's a visual representation of the three pathways. As you can see in the control, it's really dense. Pathway two is slightly less dense and there's more conifers. And pathway three is the least dense. So all of the trees have more space to grow. Next. Here's another visual representation. As you can see in the current conditions, there is a lot of hardwoods, but not a lot of redwoods. And the diameter average is pretty small. In the control for year 2080, the diameter does increase. However, the redwoods is still not a lot and there is still a lot of hardwoods left. For pathway two, there are a lot of redwoods. There's a dramatic increase in redwoods and there's also a dramatic decrease in the number of hardwoods. Pathway 13 has an increase in average diameter and there is a reduction in the hardwoods, but the increase in redwoods is not as dramatic as what you would see in pathway two. Next. So one of the other top tier goals was creating an economic benefit. 
and this was best done by Pathway 13 because it generated a positive revenue of about $600 per acre. Compare that with Pathway 2, which has a loss of around $300 per acre, and the control had no monetary gain or loss. Next. So moving on to the lower tier goals. So the first one is minimizing herbicides. This was best done by the control because um, we didn't use frilling, so there were no herbicides. Pathway 2 used frilling twice, and Pathway 13 was in the middle, and it used frilling once. For this, it's good to know that there is um, research and studies that indicate that there are no detrimental effects of herbicides if the herbicide is applied properly and according to the legal standards. So Pathway 13, even though it does use pesticides, it's good to know that there are studies showing that herbicide use can be beneficial. Next. So the carbon sequestration is another lower tier goal, and it follows the same pattern as the one we saw before, where the control is the best, it sequesters the most carbon, mostly because there's more trees, it's more dense, so there's more trees to sequester the carbon. Pathway 2 is the worst at carbon sequestration, and pathway 13 lies in the middle between the two. Next. So goal 5 is reducing fire risk. And we couldn't really rank these three pathways because the statistics were too close to each other. For example, the probability of torching between 29% and 32%, we couldn't really decide which one reduced fire risk the most, especially when we compared the crown index severe in miles per hour. So we gave them all a moderate ranking. Next. So here is the goal summary. As you can see, the control is the worst for the restoration top tier goal. However, it is the best for the second tier goals. If you look at pathway two, it's the best for the restoration top tier goal. However, it is the worst for the economic top tier goal along with the second tier goals as well. And pathway 13 is the best for the economic top tier goal. And for all of the other goals, it's moderate. It's between the control and pathway two. Next. So overall, we recommend Pathway 13. It has a very high economic benefit, an acceptable percent of conifers. The trees are large and sparsely distributed. Not too many herbicides are used and there's a decent carbon sequestration along with the medium to low probability of torching. So overall, we recommend Pathway 13 because it provides the best compromise to moderately reach all of the goals. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Eileen. Okay, so um, with a different perspective on a different take on uh, the, the best pathway, I'd like to introduce Nishida Disputi from Charter Oak High School down in uh, Southern California. So uh, go ahead, Nishida. Hi, my name is Nishida, and uh, as you can see, my team, name, team member names are up here. Uh, Emily Yu is actually here with us. and. A fun fact is that during forestry week, my team actually ate lunch and dinner together over Zoom most days while preparing for the competition. Next slide, please. So my team actually choose, chose route number eight, which was variable retention 2020, no treatment 2021, and frilling 2035. And so we highlighted that pathway, but we also considered pa pathways three and 13 and included their analysis. So first, I'd like to discuss forest vegetation simulation pathway outcomes. So I'd like to briefly touch on route number one, which is the control and route number three. So route number one is no treatment and only has 49 redwoods and 141 hardwoods per acre. Uh, we have a total basal, basal area of 305 square feet and 54% conifers per 165 acres. And it sequesters the most carbon at 381 metric tons per acre. Next, we have Route 3, which is variable retention, frilling, and manual treatment. And this has the highest amount of redwoods per acre at 83 square feet per acre and 53 square feet per acre of hardwoods, a total basal area of 195 square feet, and the highest percentage of conifers at 73% per 165 acres. Now we have our chosen pathway of Route number 8, which is variable retention, no treatment, and frilling. So we have 72 square feet per acre of redwoods and 62 square feet per acre of hardwoods, a total basal area of 187 square feet and 66% conifer, conifer per 165 acres. And this sequesters approximately 210 metric um, 
tons per acre of carbon. And lastly, we have Route 13, which is filling, a selection, harvest, and a planting, which is uh, 41 square feet of redwoods and 64 square feet per acre of hardwoods, a total berryzoal area of 198 square feet, 68% conifers per 165 acres. Now, as you can see, it's around the same percentage of conifers as Route 8, but the conifer percentage here is mainly composed of dug firs and you saw is a redwood forest, not a dug fir forest. So we really wanted to bring the emphasis back onto the redwoods. And this played a big role in um, why we chose Route 8. As for uh, carbon sequestration, we see 247 carbon uh, metric of carbon um, in metric tons per acre. Now, even though Route 8 sequesters less carbon, it has an overall low lower basal area and almost two times the basal area of redwoods than Route 13. Next slide, please. I'd like to really briefly discuss the economics as well. So the control um, would cost zero dollars because no treatment is being applied. And for Route 13, uh, the treatment cost would be $650 per acre and the net cost would be uh, negative $568. So meaning that we'd go into a debt due to the cost of manual treatment and if, and if applied to all um, acres of the mixed conifer area uh, would result in over $8.4 million of debt, which is a really significant amount. And we have Route 8, once again, our chosen pathway. We have a treatment cost of $200 per acre um, and in total would cost $118 per acre. And if applied to all would only result in 100 excuse me, $1.8 million of debt. So even though this is a loss, it can be recovered by harvesting redwoods in redwood dominant areas at $490 uh, per thousand board feet and harvesting dug firs in dug fir heavy areas at $155 per thousand board feet. And with the variable retention, you can get money immediately. You can get it up front and not have to wait 15 years before making any money at all. And this will help cover some of the uh, early costs during the treatment plan. And we have lastly, Route 13, frilling, selection harvest and plant, like I mentioned before, and would also cost $200 per acre for the treatment, but actually generate a revenue of around $638 and if applied to all acres would create a $9.4 million in uh, revenue. However, you wouldn't make any money at the beginning of the treatment. Next slide, please. So our recommended pathway would be pathway number eight for the following reasons. One of the biggest goals is to increase conifer presence. The simulation, the forest vegetation simulation, showed a significant increase in redwoods, which is a primary goal. We increased the basal area of redwoods from 30 square feet, which is what it cur uh, currently is, to 72 square feet in 280, or 2080, sorry. Uh, we'd also we all want to decrease 10 oaks. So the basal area of hardwoods would go from 90 square feet to 63 square feet per acre. And we want to reduce the amount of tan oaks, however, still sustain the, uh, have enough to sustain the wildlife such as mule deer and northern raccoons that are reliant on tan oak and its products. And while talking to Jeff Hauser, operations manager at USAW, he discussed that 30 to 40% tan oak would be ideal and Route 8 achieves this goal. Another focus is that we want to return to the stand to pre-settlement conditions. So in 1913, we had 20 trees per acre. And currently we have over 610 trees per acre. And Route 8 will allow for a 50% decrease in trees per acre to 307 trees per acre. Now I know this isn't exactly 20 trees per acre, but Route 8 is the ideal pathway in order to begin to approach this goal. Overall, the stand will be less dense and the trees will be more spread out, reducing fire risk as well. Economic benefits, like I said before, um, it would cost $118 per acre, but we were told and it was the main goal is to really re, uh, restore this force. And so we didn't consider cost itself as a major factor. And we also looked at the um, how cost can be made up with the redwood and dug fir harvest in these uh, redwood and dug fir uh, dominant areas.